first of all, can I uh, say I'm delighted to be here, and particularly at Bond University. I've only been here once before, but it is just a beautiful location uh, in a beautiful environment. And uh, when the Vice Chancellor was talking about coming from Melbourne to uh, live up here, I've got a sister who came from Melbourne to live at Yamba, which is just down the road as far as she's concerned. And she refuses to come back to Melbourne uh, uh, because she's surrounded by about four surf beaches, uh, canals, a lake. Uh, is it the Clarence River? Uh, it's just just heaven. So I really appreciate the, the physical attraction uh, of this area, but I also appreciate the intellectual attraction because uh, the universities around here, both Bond and Griffith, have made a very impressive contribution to the management of sport, and that's my background. Uh, I'm also very happy to see the word interdisciplinary used here today because I am a great believer in interdisciplinary analysis, particularly in sport, because you can cover sport from every angle and always get some fresh insight. So my job today uh, was made very simple by the Courier Mail this morning. Uh, an esteemed journalist by the name of is it Mel Meninga, yeah, Mel Meninga, <laughs> uh, was writing on page 93, and the heading was Zero Tolerance for Drugs. And I started reading through it. Then, on the adjacent page, uh, a guy called Andrew Hamilton, uh, oh, this is page four, and this is a concern for me because I'm a great fan of Gary Abler Jr., of course, who plays for the Suns. Suns are in the dark on Coke rumours. So, what could be more relevant than talking about integrity in sport? The Courier Mail uh, certainly nailed it. So, what I'm going to do today, uh, I'm going to do two things. First of all, uh, I want to look at the different ways that sport, uh, sport's reputation and its integrity has been uh, threatened by recent events and incidents. I'm going to take a 15-year period. I'm going to start in 2000, and the reason becomes obvious why it's 2000, and then take you up to, well, this week, virtually. Uh, then the second part is a bit more difficult, and I'm hoping you guys will fill in the gaps over the next few hours, because I want to just talk briefly about what are the policy options for managing these threats? And uh, as you were saying, the, the threats uh, are often not very well managed. And in some cases, and I think the Essendon Football Club is an example down in Melbourne, uh, it was so mismanaged that the whole thing was exacerbated by the, the poor management of the, the whole uh, fiasco, as it turned out. So they're the two things uh, I want to look at. So the first thing I'm going to do is have a look at some of the incidents that we designate as uh, threatening the integrity of sport. And I'd like you to just reflect on them. I've, I've selected 20, some of which I'll spend a bit of time on, so I'll just zip over. But they're my 20, and I'll be missing out on a few which you think, hang on, Bob, why didn't you include this incident? So uh, I'm going to talk about the subjectivity of interpreting these incidents as well uh, later on, because I don't think they're often as black and white as we uh, think they are. So I thought I'd start off with... <coughs> This classic photo. That was the um, press conference convened by two ministers, now it's two, two years ago, where they were suggesting that this was close to being the blackest day in an Australian sport. And why was it the blackest day? Well, I think the next few slides will... Uh, assist in uh, helping us resolve that problem. But were, I've never seen so many earnest people in my life. I thought World War Three had just begun. But no, uh, it was an issue in and around drug use uh, in sport and some of the criminal connections that were, were part of that. So let's begin by looking at a series of incidents. Now, there's incident one. Now, is that integrity threatening or not? Andrew Simons, I know, uh, was a fairly uh, assertive character. Some called him charismatic, others called him a bully, but it depends what angle you want to take. Was that integrity threatening or was that just part of the game? Was that just a bit of gamesmanship that goes on uh, with professional sports people? So I'll leave that one to one side, but then suggest that maybe the next one, there's no ambiguity at all. 
uh, the Hansi Cronier Affair of 2000. Now, he was a guy who was completely respected worldwide for his cricket prowess. He was captain of the South African team, one of the best in the world. And yet, he was found to have accepted bribes from bush, bush, uh, bookmakers to intervene in matches and to forecast results, as the, the terminology said. And he was banned from cricket for life. And that's where I think people understood that at the elite level, even within the most respected of, of uh, environments, you had corruption occurring. So that's why I chose 2000, because I thought that was a watershed moment for looking at the whole issue of sport integrity and the threats to sports integrity. Now, this is a case that came a little bit after. Maybe some of you aren't aware of this, but uh, I remember doing a study on it. Mark French was a member of the 2004 Australian Olympic track team. And uh, they were having a training camp in Adelaide and uh, some cleaners found a whole lot of used syringes in a bin in his room. And he was subsequently uh, examined and he was found to have used, or no, to have been in possession, but not used. They couldn't provide evidence that he'd used, but he'd been in possession of a growth hormone. In fact, a, a growth hormone that was injected to animals. Uh, but they used it for, for human consumption. And he was suspended for two years. He did appeal uh, on the basis of some flimsy evidence, evidence he got off. But to this day, no one knows what was going on in that room at the training centre. But uh, he claimed that every one of the track cyclists he was training with were using these substances. But nothing has ever, ever happened. Interestingly... Uh, the track team achieved its best ever results at an Olympic Games. So that's another, I think, interesting case to, to consider. 2006 was a year which I found difficult to believe this, that this just isn't, isn't an ordinary group of teams. Juventus just isn't a run-of-the-mill football club. It's one of the world's elite sporting organisations. AC Milan is not far behind. Lazio is also a regular Serie 1 participant. And yet we found a, a, just a complete and comprehensive scandal in and around betting and match fixing. Uh, the Juventus manager, Luciano Moggi, was given a life ban. Lazio was banned from the UEFA Cup. Uh, and Juventus was initially relegated to Serie, B, uh, Serie C, but then on appeal got back into Serie B. Uh, so you had this overwhelming sense that Italian football was corrupt at every level. But as you're saying, sometimes things are forgotten, and Juventus is back, is back playing well and back playing, I think, in the Champions League too. So that was a, a major crisis of confidence uh, in sport. Uh, this one, I, I didn't quite know how to deal with this, but again, I think there's evidence to say that incidents like this also threaten the integrity of sport. Uh, and a young New Zealand girl, after I think I've said there's seven years of emotional agony, decided to go public and report that she had in fact been gang raped by a number of NRL players, which was... And to be fair to Matthew John, he, he wasn't part of that. Uh, she apparently had consensual sex with him, but it degenerated into a gang rape situation in her mind. Uh, I wasn't sure quite what happened in the end, but John's was temporarily suspended from uh, the footy show. I use the term show loosely, when having watched the footy show. I suppose it's a show, but... So, how do we deal with that as a threat to sports integrity? It's not match fixing, it's not doping, but it does, for a lot of people, sully the reputation of the sport. And the NRL, as we well know, uh, is very adept at bringing up these problematic issues with the behaviour of players. 
Then, of course, we had the, the Pakistani cricketer spot fixing incidents. And this is where the idea of spot betting came into prominence because now it wasn't a matter of fixing the match, but it was a matter of fabricating or contriving a, mi a microscopic result within a match. And uh, it was found that uh, a number of Pakistani players had been um, incentivised, if you like, to underperform at certain parts of the game. And uh, they were found to have uh, done this and they were banned from playing international cricket. And in fact, there were two criminal sentences given to two of the players. And that brought international cricket certainly into disrepute. And again, these were elite players. Who's the very best of Pakistani cricketers in bowling? And I hate to say this because I became a fan of the Melbourne Storm in their glory years. Um, and unfortunately, a, a guy who used to manage the St Kilda Football Club took over as the manager of the Melbourne Storm Football Club and decided that the salary cap was there merely to breach rather than to uh, adhere to. And unfortunately, uh, there were breaches between 2006 and 2010 and the NRL came down on Melbourne Storm like a ton of bricks. And I don't think this had ever happened before where a club had been stripped of its premiership cups and fined at least $2 million in the process. And as an AFL supporter, I found this rather harsh because, maybe I don't, it was a 10 years earlier, the Carlton Football Club had involved, been involved in something similar and, and their punishment uh, was not to have draft picks and a, and a fine. But there's no way they were going to be suspended from the competition. But again, this is clearly an example of a sport under threat. Its integrity, its goodwill, its good name is being threatened at every turn here. And again, is, ask, is, that, is this cheating or is it something else? But it's still a problem. Now, this is something that uh, a lot of people have ignored over here, but it's more to do with, in this case, not uh, deliberately and fraudulently uh, using money for the wrong purpose, but it's just being poor managers. And in, I think it was the five years up to 2010, 300 professional football clubs at the elite level in Europe were unable to make profit. And two had, 200 of them had negative equity, which means that if you looked at their accumulated liabilities and their accumulated assets, they had more liabilities than assets. They were technically then insolvent. And this is the, these aren't community club. We're looking at these uh, professional sporting clubs. And I think there's a paper on this, and in response to the scandal, uh, UFA have introduced a financial fair play regulation uh, model, the FFP, where the aim is to regulate operating uh, spending particularly, and also to try and regulate levels of debt that have been incurred. Now again, I've suggested this sort of misbehaviour or, or mismanagement is an additional threat not just to the integrity of sport, to the, but to the whole viability and sustainability of sport. If you were running a business with that sort of financial numbers, you'd be thinking, how do I get out of this as quickly as I can? But in sport, and particularly in football, uh, it seems to be part of the course. Now, I've done no work on this yet, but if you were to look at the A-League in Australia, some of you would say, oh, the A-League's progressing very well, crowds are up, it's getting enormous media support. But I think only one club is able to sustain its operations without the support of external funding. So how does the league talk about sustainability if most of its clubs cannot meet their uh, operating expenditures? Is that a threat to sports integrity? Uh, this is more a tragedy than a, uh, than a threat <coughs> to sports integrity. But it's happened before, uh, and I'm afraid to say it happened again only a few weeks ago in, in Egypt. 
In 2012, there was a riot uh, in a match at Port Said. 74 fans were killed in this riot. Uh, it was a bit more complicated than, than was anticipated because there was a political dimension to it. Police were implicated uh, together with a, a military council that assumed power. But who knows what happened, but it happened and it decimated uh, the national Egyptian soccer league for a time. So is that a threat to integrity? Or is it just bad luck or poor management? Well, it's clearly a, a major threat to the whole sustainability of a competition when that sort of incident happens. Um, this always concerned me because many years ago when, it, when I actually had a body that worked, uh, I played a few games for the Melbourne Demons. <laughs> uh, and ever since I left, they've underperformed on a regular basis. <laughs> Even when they were there, I was un they were underperforming. But in this case, um, they underperformed because there was something in it for them to underperform. And uh, it's called tanking. Uh, so with the incentive of getting a priority draft pick at the end of the season, the, um, the option was to not play up to your standard, lose a couple of games along the way at the end, and then get these priority draft picks. So there was a, an incentive to not win at the end of the season. Uh, there was a lot of arguing about what tanking meant and, and what represented tanking. But in the end, Bailey and Conley, the two coaches, were found not to be engaged in tanking, and I need legal advice on this, but they were found to have acted in a manner detrimental to the interests of the competition. So I'd like to know just exactly what that meant. But it wasn't tanking, but it was something else. What it was, I'm not sure. But they, did, they were suspended for, I think, uh, half a full season. So it was taken uh, seriously. Again in Melbourne in 2013, something happened that we just didn't think would happen. A suburban, well, a good suburban team, because it played in the Victorian Premier League, so it wasn't just a, a small community club team, was found to have been <coughs> infiltrated by a betting syndicate, and that betting syndicate paid off at least two players to underperform. Uh, Joe Woolley and Rhys Snow <coughs> were each fined around $1,500, which is viewed in as a light sentence, you know, given that they could have got a, a prison sentence. But the uh, syndicate organiser uh, pleaded guilty and was given a prison sentence because of that. So for the first time, we now saw that match fixing was part of club soccer in Melbourne, in Victoria. Again, how do you handle that enormous threat to the integrity of your competition? This is an interesting one. Uh, because I've done a bit of work in, uh, in drug use, I thought I'd throw this one in because it didn't get a lot of publicity. But uh, a St Kilda AFL player, Ahmad Saad, failed a post-match, and it's important to note, in-competition drug test. He, found, he was found to have used a stimulant. And I wasn't clear just what that stimulant was, but it was a sufficient. It was a banned stimulant. And as a banned stimulant that was taken on match day, Saad was liable for a two-year suspension. Now, no one sort of took the time to think, well, yeah, what sort of effect would this have had? He claimed it was inadvertent because he was both promoting and using a particular uh, energy drink. He said the energy drink contained these stimulants, and some energy drinks do, but, of course, under the WADA regulation, he has to take full responsibility for the use and uh, even though he reckoned he had an excuse, he was given a 1.5 year suspension. Now, had he taken that drug out of competition, he would have got nothing. So this is where I think people have to be careful with drug use too and dopey. It was a maximum two year suspension for in competition, but he could have got away with it out of competition. So for me, that was a little bit harsh, but hey, that's what he had to, to deal with. Now, this was a tragedy. I don't know if you remember this, going back, uh, well, over two years now. This is a, an ultra-marathon event uh, in the Kimberley in uh, Western Australia. And there was a bit of burning off 
uh, and there was the potential for a lot of fire, which was very hot. And a number of athletes were severely burned. Some were close to death. I think three were close to death. And they've had to deal with just massive burns. It was just a tragedy all, all around. Uh, there was a committee of inquiry. The Western Australian government dealt in detail with the, the case and found that the event had been effectively mismanaged. There was no risk management plan in place for the eventua uh, eventuation of a fire. Uh, the country fire authority there hadn't even been consulted. It was a complete mess. And in the end, there was a massive threat to this event's credibility uh, and integrity. So this whole area of risk management clearly becomes another uh, threat to sports integrity. I, uh, someone at work gave me this lead. Uh, just a few months ago, a guy called Ben Flower, I called it a brain snap, you may want to call it something else, just thuggish behaviour. Uh, between Wigan and St Helens in the uh, rugby league, he decided it wasn't enough to knock someone out when they're both in the uh, vertical position, but also do it when the other player was in the horizontal position. So when the guy was down, he continued to thump him uh, uh, while he was unconscious on the field of play. Now, if something if that's not threatening the integrity of a sport, then what is? This guy was suspended for six months, uh, and some people thought this was a massive let off. This guy should have been given years, maybe life, for such a despicable act. And again, if I take you back to the Amar Saad one with stimulants on the day, he got 1.5 years for taking a stimulant that may or may not have impacted on his performance, this guy gets six months for brutally attacking uh, an opponent. So I'll just get you to think about the equity of those two cases. And this is, this is again, hard to believe, isn't it? This case, Ray Rice, uh, a champion player with the Baltimore Ravens NFL team, was found to have knocked out a woman, as it turned out, his wife, not just anybody, his wife, unconscious in an elevator, and then proceeded to drag her out as if nothing had happened. Uh, this is all found out, it was recorded, and his employment arrangements were immediately terminated. But as well as that, though, it, it ignited a, a nationwide debate about domestic violence and sexual assault and the link that it may or may not have with professional sports people and athletes. And this is something we may want to talk about as well. Is there evidence to say that in professional sport that these sorts of behaviours are more or less prevalent? I don't think there is at the moment, but uh, some people believe intuitively this might be the case. And I could go on. Uh, down to number 20. So the Qatar, uh, we all know, well, Australia has spent, I think, millions on trying to influence uh, this event too. Qatar did. Down in Melbourne, uh, and I think it was maybe across Australia too, um, there are allegations that trainers had administered cobalt, which is a banned substance that can increase um, endurance for their horses. That's now being looked at as we speak. And again, I saw an interview, it was on BBC World, I think, where Lance Armstrong said that if he had to do it all over again, he would have doped anyway. So that's how he saw it. Given the circumstances, he would have doped. And that uh, disgusting <laughs> use of live bait by greyhound racing trainers to, again, incentivise their, their dogs was also uh, something that I think has nearly destroyed the reputation of greyhound racing in Australia. I think most of you would have seen that Four Corners documentary. To see those piglets up there as live bait uh, was just absolutely disgusting. And as we speak, and it's good to be here, this is the place where it's happening at the moment, on the Gold Coast. <laughs> uh, and I have to say, in defence of Carmichael, I don't care what, well, I do care, what he does outside of the, the game, but he 
still for me is Australia's greatest ever all-round footballer. No one has ever done <laughs> what he has done as a, a footballer athlete. I've got someone saying no, but I can't think of anyone else. Is Ralph Lau? No. Carmichael Hunt. But having said that, uh, he's in trouble. So are the Gold Coast Titans, it looks like. Um, and some other rugby league players are also implicated in this. So I could go on. I'm sure you could go on by saying, oh, Bob, haven't, but why didn't you include such and such? So there's a litany of incidents that uh, sports are dealing with and are having to deal with. And it must be an enormous challenge for sport managers because they've got to be good at everything now. You know, they've got to be great lawyers, they've got to be great communicators, psychologists, mentors, planners, strategists, the lot. That's uh, a really challenging time. But having said that, um, they pose a serious threat, but What I wanted to get you today was to just reflect for a little bit on what we mean by integrity in sport. And it's something I've had to grapple with. I said, I've used the word a lot before. What do I really, what do I really mean? What is, what is at the heart of integrity? What is it about sport that means it's threatened by those sorts of incidents? And then I, I just thought, what words might best describe what underpins the integrity of sport? And I thought of words like authenticity, trustworthiness, transparency, good standing, goodwill, credibility, reputation, then getting into the management speak of brand equity, and then the, sort of nearly the economic stuff of social utility and public value. So what, what word best articulates or exemplifies the position of integrity? And I had a little bit of a problem with this, uh, but I ended up using or, or focusing on two words, authenticity and credibility. Authenticity because as I think one of the, uh, uh, I think the Vice Chancellor said, once a sport has been compromised by someone coming in and contriving to fix a result, then it loses all authenticity. It's no longer what you think it is. It's an exhibition. It's a bit of theatre. It's not sport. So for me, authenticity is an important component of, <clears throat> of integrity. Because it is all about uncertain outcomes. No one wants to know what the result is. That's the beauty of sport, isn't it? You, you can't predict the result. But if a match fixer comes in, then you're going to sway the balance one way or the other. And that's when in my view, sport does become corrupted and it loses all authenticity. And the same with credibility. Credibility is about delivering on your promise and also adding public value, that it's actually something that, that has legitimacy within the wider community and people feel good that this has occurred. And in some cases, we don't feel good that something happened. And for me, that results in a loss of credibility. Now, this is, again, very tentative, so I'll be interested in your own responses to, to how you get underneath the term integrity and try and define it more precisely. And then, having defined it precisely, look at the incidents that will threaten more than others. And that's the, the other issue that I've come to trying to work out, is how might we uh, categorise or typologise some of those 20 all of those 20 incidents I looked at. Are there themes where you can group some and then develop a, you know, a simple taxonomy typology around them? So I'm working on my assumption that the core values of sport in and around integrity are authenticity and credibility. There's a little blue shield that you know, it's, it's trying to protect the integrity. And then I thought, let's look at some of the thematic factors that are going to threaten that integrity. So the first two, and down the bottom, deviant social conduct. I wasn't certain how to, to use these words, but 
Illicit drug use is also a criminal act, but it's also a lot of sociologists deviant. In other words, it's beyond the norm. Uh, you know, sex parties, all these sleazy things that players and others do, which you can, which aren't necessarily illegal, but they don't look good. And people are prepared to pass judgment on them, often negatively. So that's one theme set of uh, forces that would undermine the credibility and authenticity of sport. The second one, as I mentioned, I've called derelict financial management, overspending, salary cap violations, and all those sorts of things to do with the management of money and the use of that money in a sport setting. So there are two, but there's, I've identified five more. If you're like, that's just the beginning. And of course, you have to mention what I've called the overperformance, where athletes do things to gain an advantage, and doping is one of them, but using particular new technologies that might be available to you and no one else can also give you an advantage. So something that gives you a performance advantage that isn't <coughs> available to others. And doping falls within that. So clearly there's a problem with doping. Uh, all those behaviours and conducts that come under what I call discrimination, sexism, racism, homophobia, misogyny, bigotry, all those things that we talk about too and, and, and suggest that haven't been uh, moved away from sport, that sport does still exhibit those traits. And if it does, then its integrity is being undermined. As soon as this comes to the surface, then sport has to deal with it. If it doesn't, its reputation gets sullied. That's four. Uh, the fifth one, fifth and sixth, sorry, uh, player and spectator violence. Uh, Australian sport hasn't operated at the scale that European sport does when it comes to spectator violence, but uh, it's there. Uh, one day cricket at the MCG, uh, there's, in, there's always an enormous number of evictions, there's a lot of uh, aggressive behaviour, there's a lot of loutish behaviour and a lot of drunken behaviour. So it's there as an issue. And player violence, of course. Uh, players used to do things on the field of play, as we well know, which were to stay there, but now we've seen that these are criminal acts, they're personal assaults, grievous bodily harm, all being done in the name of winning a game. That's a major problem. And again, the what I call unmitigated risk management, injury and trauma from not providing a safe playing environment or a safe watching environment. And the final one is, of course, which is a bit of a theme uh, today, underperformance. The things that are done to minimise or reduce performance. So for me there, so it gets a bit more complicated than we think. There's for me the seven categories you could use initially to better understand the way in which the integrity of sport is being threatened by a whole range of, of forces and factors and, and conduct. Now I tried to visually represent what I thought were the importance of each one. So for me, the, the one thing that truly does immediately undermine sports integrity is the underperformance one, because that's what you don't expect in sport. Sport is about a contest, a real contest, real people going for it. And when that's compromised, it's no longer sport. And the others we can then argue about. Overperformance, yeah, uh, I think Derelict financial management is clearly uh, one. The others, I think we can discuss where they fit and where you'd emphasise one against uh, the other. And I think uh, we can have an interesting discussion about that. And that then leads on to the issue of saying not all incident, incidents are the same. I think you have to uh, demarcate one from the other. Um, and some incidents get exaggerated. And I'll get on to this in a minute, that there is a degree of subjectivity with all of this. We can't get consensus very often on the scale of the, uh, of the threat and what its implications are. And some inc incidents might even get triple eyes, so you can work the other way. There's it, uh, what some people think is a serious uh, 
breach of ethics. Uh, other people say, oh, it's just young men you know, behaving exuberantly. So there's a whole set of what I would call subjectivities involved in this. We don't get consensus, and I think it's important to understand that there is disagreement on how we rate and weight those factors. Because there's been a little bit of work done on this notion of moral panic, uh, not so much in sport but in other areas. So the idea is that if something offends your moral sensibilities, then you tend to exaggerate the scale of the problem, even if there's not much evidence. So for me as a drug researcher, I sometimes think that there is a case of moral panic because the actual incident uh, may or may not impact severely on the uh, particular uh, club or league, particularly if it's the use of an illicit substance rather than a performance enhancing substance. So a lot of people follow the moral panic route in, in how they examine and tell the story of the incident to others, while others, I try this but I'm not very successful, so you, you develop an arm's length utilitarian rational theory of objectively standing aside and saying, okay, let's look at the, the facts and let's look at the uh, implications in a rational way for the integrity of this sport. And that leads on to a series of a process you go through. But you can see where, depending on which model you use or which aspect you come from, you can end up with very harsh laws and usually the moral panic proponents and the moral regulation that follows will, will recommend a very harsh punitive approach to the problem, while those who try to be impartial objective, often in a very calculating way, but maybe too calculating, may work for a rearrangement of the regulations, but also one that tries to uh, not punish, but rehabilitate or re-educate or re-socialise the offenders. So, I'm suggesting that sports integrity and good standing can no longer be taken for granted. I think we all agree on that. There's so much happening that's threatening it. The problem cannot be solved by wishing it would go away. The problem can only be solved, in my view, by or through regulation of some sort. And this is where I'm very vague. The question then is, well, what sort of regulation do we need? What form should it take? And at the moment, I think there's a divide between what you might call the hard line zero tolerance. And this is Mel. What did Mel say? Ah, uh, there he is. Zero. Mel wants zero tolerance. OK, that's, that's his view. But there's also an alternative, so sometimes critically called the soft response, which is all about harm reduction, re-education, re-socialisation, that you don't punish the daylights out of someone, you actually go in and try and re-socialise the person and the instigators. Or you go somewhere in between. So... At a minimum, sports integrity can only be assured if the following conditions are met. So, very briefly, these are just ideas that came to my mind. You need law-abiding and trustworthy governance. So governance is a key here. We've all talked about governance. You need strong, effective and professional governance. And I've used the word trustworthy there. You need ethical and accounting management, accountable management. Um, Maybe just professional management, you know, people who are actually are skilled in the technical capability of managing. I know in sport, you, you, one gets concerned with the way in which uh, people who purport to be managers actually do organise their club, their association. <laughs> Transparent decision making. Now, I think this is, for me, absolutely essential. Now, I don't want to be too critical of Football Federation Australia and it's A-League. But if you want to do any analysis, any financial analysis of the A-League and the FFA, you can't. Why can't you? Because the data doesn't exist. The FFA hasn't published an annual report since 2009. 
So how can you do any analysis of FFA and its financial arrangements if the financial report is not publicly available? Now, it must be somewhere. Uh, and again, because I think most of the clubs are privately owned, it's very difficult to access the financial statements of the members of the A-League. So if you want to do a financial analysis of the A-League and look at its financial liability, you can't because the data is not available. It's there, but for some reason or other, FFA decide that they don't want the public to know. Okay, fair enough. Is that good for the integrity of a sport? I don't think uh, it is. And again, these words that I've tried to sort of move around, authenticity, credibility, fair play, inclusion, equity, and social justice may need to be built in to the mission and vision statements of sporting organisations. And maybe organisations need to, and some have already, uh, actually create and establish integrity units within their organisations to better deal with these sort of incidents we've uh, examined. So to end, Uh, I'm certain this is just the beginning. I'm hopefully just putting these out as uh, ideas for you to think about. But today's conference will give us many valuable guidelines for handling the many incidents, crises and scandals that threaten sports integrity. And I've just mentioned a few and there's another one that the NFL have been dealing with. Thank you.